everybody, how's it going? Welcome back. We're back into uh, the MTG book series that we've been doing. I made a few changes. Voice quality might be a little better. Following videos on MTG, I just realized were bad quality. Like it was a little blurry. I mean, it was clear, but it was just not like one is to one or up to par to my standards. I still am trying to work, make a work around, around on it. So uh, Eldrin is out. And uh, so we made a few changes. We're going to make a few changes to the voices as I learn how they sound. Um, don't worry, it's a reading. No, nothing's going to change with the content. Uh, except for, you know, probably how I deliver their voices. But anyway, that's, uh, that's, 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 that's all, I suppose. Let's get into it. Alright, here we go. Chapter 11. Sword in hand, Rowan swung up on her horse. We can't let the stag get away, Rowan called after her. Not the Jade Bridge. You have to cross by the bridge the stag used. Rowan halted. You said the Jade Bridge is a safe bridge, since both bridges cross the river. Isn't it better to use the Jade Bridge? What makes you think they go to the same shore? They crossed the same river to the same island, said Rowan. Even though it was now daylight, it was impossible to make out the landscape on the other side. She squinted, which only made the effect worse, as if the land beyond lay out of focus the way the world slips into double vision. It's the way things look when you cross your eyes. Elowen smiled condescendingly. This is what comes of youths. Who aren't educated at Vantress. The other courts think loyalty and persistence or courage or strength are enough. But without knowledge, none of these suffice. Even Caddo knows that. He shook his head, considering the ashes. Loyalty is the highest virtue. That is why I stayed at Ardenvale and you left. Rowan is correct. We best move swiftly so the stag doesn't escape us. Elowen led her mount to the foot of the obsidian bridge, giving the span a dour look as if her gaze could transform its substance. Rowan came up beside her. Where does this bridge go, if not to the same place as the Jade Bridge? Elowen cast her an exasperated glance. How should I know? I never cross obsidian bridges when I travel the wilds. No one with a grain of wit ever does. Not if they want to return home in one piece and with their minds intact. Why not? Every obsidian bridge houses a deadly guardian intent on killing you. Maybe a troll. Maybe a four-armed tentacled howlback. Maybe a horned viper. I'll go first, Rowan pushed past her. I'm less afraid of death than I am of... Never getting our father back. He rode her horse at a cautious walk over the span, awaiting a monster's attack. The black stone had a slippery texture, disquieting in the way your senses can warn you about a half-hidden object you don't want to touch. Unlit lanterns furled as tight as sleeping bags hung from poles along the bridge's railing. The bridge ran for far longer than it looked from the shore, what appeared from the clearing to be a narrow, watery way was revealed to be a wide and sluggish river whose waters churned with ominous eddies and grasping whirlpools. A large serpent-like beast, trickling with a spiky crest, slithered just beneath the surface. When they reached the midway point, a pair of white-bodied figures popped up beneath the piers that supported the central span. Naked from the waist, they beckoned to the travelers with gracefully waving arms. At first, Rowan thought they were unusually beautiful undines calling out in silent greeting. Then they grinned with two exposed razor teeth meant for eating flesh. These were dark undines. Behind her, Elowen had commenced lecturing. The wilds don't behave in the orderly way you are accustomed to in the realm. For example... Ordinary stone bridges are fixed and permanent, but in the wilds, other bridges may appear and disappear at random. 
You find them in one spot one day, and they vanish the next, only to reappear elsewhere. Such bridges are always carved out of one of five different substances. Ivory, Apislazuli, Obsidian, Ruby, or Jade, said Will unexpectedly. He rode behind Elwyn, with Cerise and Caddo at the rear. Well, I am impressed, young Will. You'll fit right in at Vantress if we survive this expedition. You never answered how they can go to the same shore but different places. Rowan said, ready to burst from frustration as she tried to get the far shore to come into focus so she could follow the stag. How can a river be wider than it looks from the shore? I'm glad you asked. The heart realm of the wilds isn't one single place, but many possible places. The bridges extend into different emanations, shall we say, of the island that lies on the other side. Some are considerably more dangerous than others. At last, the bridges span sloped down to touch the earth. If the land ahead was an island, Rowan could see no banks, no sense of scale. Turf and tree-covered hills rose in the distance. Closer at hand lay the ruins of a city long since fallen into disrepair. Pathways wound maze-like through clusters of elegant buildings whose roofs had collapsed. Trees twisted through shattered walls, and their grasping roots framed doorways. She rode into a sun-drenched field carpeted in red poppies, delicate, white lily of the valley, and purple crocus, all beautiful and poisonous. The stag stood amid the blooms, head proudly raised as it looked back at them as if it had expected them to follow. A big man emerged from a gap in the tangle of thorny vegetation that grew around the edge of the field. He wore the rough clothing of a hunter and carried a huge axe. A headache sprang to life between Rowan's eyes. She was sure she ought to know the man, but when her mind tried to grab hold of a name, it felt as if a hammer were pounding against her memory so loudly she couldn't hear the answer. Will pushed up beside her, face flushed, breath ragged with excitement, or nerves, or perhaps a headache matched to her own. Rowan, does he look familiar? Again, the painfully sharp whistles resounded. Its source within the forested ruins, the man retreated into the shadows as if he too were being hauled by an invisible leash. The stag ran after him, racing out of sight between the trees. Hurry! Rowan galloped across the meadow, Will right behind and Cerise following. She heard Elwyn's voice calling after them, but she didn't stop. A path opened where two yew trees bent so their branches intertwined to make an opening in the dense growth. Rowan pressed her horse forward into the gloom. The track was so heavily overhung by trees that little light reached the ground. Forgotten buildings loomed within the tangle of forest on either side. Feet, hands, arms, and crowns from dismembered statues littered the path, forcing her to a cautious walk. The path wound through the undergrowth as far as she could see, fading into dimness. An animal rustled through the vegetation to her left. When she glanced that way, she saw the pale glow of an unicorn's horn. Had Cerise taken a different path? But she'd seen no other path, no fork in the trail. What? Was the Heart Realm trying to separate them? Cerise! She called. Hush! Don't call attention to us! Scolded Will. Did you see another path where she might have... She broke off a moment ago. The path had cut straight through the forest with no branches or forks. Now straight ahead, the trail split into two. They halted. Which way did the stag go? Will raised a trembling arm to point down the rightward fork. A massive dragon skull as tall as a house sat on the path, facing them with its bony jaws gaping wide open. The trail led into the skull. Light shone at the end of the long tunnel it made. A glimpse to an open space not covered by trees. That skull, that was in our visions, he said. 
starting forward. I think we're meant to go through there. Fibrous vines twisted around the upper part of the jaw, holding it taut rather like a portcullis held open by a winch at Castle Ardenvale. Rowan couldn't help but wonder what would happen if the vines snapped just as they rode underneath the dragon's teeth. But she wasn't about to say so aloud, not even to Will. She didn't want him to think she was afraid, even though she was terrified. Elowen might lecture on and on about the glorious mysteries of the wilds, but Rowan just wanted to find the stag. Find their father, and get out before they got horribly killed like Titus. She shouldn't have raced ahead onto the Jade Bridge. She should have stayed loyally back with her friend, shoulder to shoulder. But the Lich Knight's ghastly stench and chilling magic had terrified her into letting Titus take rear guard alone. Will reached the dragon's maw. He looked back at her with head tilted to one side questioningly. Rowan? Furious with herself, she urged her mount forward. The mare's ears flicked back and forth at the sight of the huge skull, but she moved forward obedient to her rider's command. Inside the skull, the air had a peculiar sweet smell. Its curved interior gleamed softly. Sparks floated high up in its cranium like a dance of fireflies. It was oddly peaceful. Will whispered, Do you hear voices ahead? The back of the skull opened onto a stone-paved plaza choked with flowering shrubs and tall grass. The headless body of the dragon was curled into an oval. Because it had been turned to stone, it formed a wall three stories high around an unseen open space inside. The tip of its tail had pinched up where it met the severed neck, the curve forming a gateway. Climbing roses with flowers as red as blood grew from cracks in shield-sized scales that had the texture of granite. One wing had been unfurled at the moment the dragon had been turned to stone, left sticking straight up into the sky to such a height that Rowan had to lean backward to see the top. A flame burned at the shining tip of the wing. They had found the amphitheater mentioned by Elowen, carved out of the body of a petrified dragon. Argumentative voices came from the inside. Rowan dismounted and handed her reins to Will. As he led the horses behind a concealing height of brush, she padded over to the wall. Her gloves and armor protected her from the thorns, and the cracks between the petrified scales of the dragon made it easy for her to climb to the top. Inside the central area was filled with tiers of stone seats, built in an oval. A crested eagle perched on the far wall, overlooking a meeting taking place below. A crude campfire burned on the central oval. Eight elves sat on broken stones around the fire, arguing. The only elves Rowan had ever seen were Queen Ayara and some of the courtiers of Loctwain. With their elegant attire and sophisticated haughtiness, the elves of the wild had little in common with their kinfolk who had stayed in the realm. They wore crowns of flowers and leaves in their hair, clothing woven of flax and thistle, and they bore keen, quick expressions. But the most shocking sight at the meeting was Queen Ayara standing to one side like a humble onlooker. She wore black riding clothes instead of her usual sweeping black gown, with golden brooches in the shape of goblets pinned to the lapels of her jacket. Her hair was braided into a tight crown, leaving her face unveiled. She didn't look old, elves never did, but there was an indefinable air of great age and ancient exasperation as she glared, hands on hips, at the young elf who was speaking to the council. The time to attack is now, while the realm is weakened, while they squabble in disorder and disagreement, said this individual, a gloriously handsome young person. He held a beautifully carved bow in his brown hands. We can start tonight. For generations, we've been confined within the wilds. What's to stop us from riding through the realm this midwinter? To hunt where we choose, as we used to. To take our pick of prey, as we ought to be able to do. You young fool, snapped Ayara. What do you think we'll accomplish? except to terrorize the inhabitants of the realm. They terrorize us with their quests and their rules. You have become complacent. 
a collaborator. A swirl of dust spun a whirlwind of magic around the council, forming a tall column in a funnel of air meant to sweep Lock Twain's queen off her feet. Ayara brushed it aside with a casual flick of a hand as she continued speaking. You parrot the words of an individual who has been traveling through the wild since autumn, goading you to attack. According to the report sent to me by my envoy, this person is a stranger to us. Why do you trust him, Illidan? Because he is correct. He raised his bow toward the sky. The hunt rides tonight, and this year we ride where we wish. Another elf spoke, although she looked no older than Illidan. There was something about her voice that held a time-worn weight of caution. Ayara is correct. You'd say so, Welfra, Elodon retorted. You and she are cousins. Do you not respect our ancient clans and ties of kinship? Ayara does. That is why she hunts with us every midwinter, although the hunt is forbidden in the realm. The meal we share at the end of the hunt binds our clans together. It binds the earth and the sky together. So it has always been. So it will always be. Since before you were born, Stripling, remarked Ayara with a curl of her lips, Elfra waved her to silence and turned back to the young elf. You should be asking yourself where the stranger came from and which clan he belongs to. No one knows him. Worse, he brings a corruption with him that harms the wilds. Have you not seen the dead beasts eaten away by a magical curse none of us recognize? He's no friend of ours, Illidan. He doesn't need to be our friend. He needs only to be our ally. With the High King missing, and every court suspicious of the others, we can push back effectively at long last. Reclaim what has always been rightfully ours. Elfra held a spear decorated with copper and bronze leaves. He stamped its haft on the ground. Be careful of what you think you know. You're too young to recall the days when we retreated into the wilds. And what happened then? Beyond that, the stranger claims to have bespelled the High King, but cannot produce him. I'm not against taking back what we've lost, but we need concentrate assurances that following a stranger's counsel would not lead us into a worse disaster. I advise reproachment with Castle Ardendale, said Ayara. There has never been a better time to seek to reach a more advantageous understanding with Queen Linden. If you can find Alginus Kenrith and restore him to the throne, it might allow our people to... Illidan leaped to his feet, shaking the bow at her. Appeasement! Surrender! Never! The others broke out in angry remonstrances some crying out against any negotiations with the realm, others supporting Ayara and Elfra. A few refused to engage in the dispute as they instead sharpened their spear points for the hunt that would set off at dusk. A flurry of wings pulled Rowan's attention away from the council. The crested eagle had flown over to perch a short distance away, watching her with a disturbingly acute gaze. What if it were like that Garen Brignite's hawk, an animal bound to a master for whom it could spy? She edged backward and climbed down. No one in the council oval raised an alert, so maybe it had just been a curious eagle. From Will's hiding place, they could see no other way out of the plaza. In silence, they rode back through the skull and took the fork that led left through the dense growth and empty ruins. When they had gotten far enough away, Will finally spoke in a low voice. What did you say? A council of elves. Queen Ayara was there. What? How did she get here? King Yorvo must have sent her through the portal right before us. 
and then he didn't mention it to us. Is that normal? I don't know. He's not obliged to tell us his other business, is he? You think Ayara... You think Queen Ayara has something to do with Father's disappearance? That's what they claim at Garenbrig. She told the council she didn't. There really is a midwinter hunt every year. Like, cranky old villagers always claim their grandmother's grandmother talk about. Really? Yes. The elves are preparing for it right now. Apparently, Ayara secretly takes part in the hunt every year. Why would you do that? They said it is an ancient clan tradition. They eat what they kill all together. Some kind of magical ceremony to bind the earth and sky. What if all those villages are right? And there really is a sacrifice. Trust good old Will not to look shocked. He merely nodded. We go hunting and have feasts afterward too. Jared blood binds. That's what the Laurel Mages say. That would explain why Ayara vanishes every midwinter solstice. But why does she keep it a secret? Is she ashamed of it? It sounded to me as if no one in the realm is meant to take part in the midwinter hunt. As if there is an old agreement about it. A broken contract? That makes me more suspicious of her. What if she just has been waiting for a good chance to overthrow the realm? All these years? She's been alive a really long time, Will. If not her, then who's causing all this trouble? They were talking about a stranger. Someone wandering the wilds trying to convince the elves to attack the realm now that father is missing. Queen Ayara wants the council to open negotiations with mother, but that will never happen. The realm and the wilds will always be opposed. I, I don't know. What if... What if it doesn't have to be that way? Now you sound like Lormage Elwin. But here's another strange thing. I came under surveillance by a crested eagle. Like Alona's hawk. So we have to be even more cautious. And there's worse. The midwinter hunt must be gathering nearby. We've got to find the stag. And get out of here before the portal closes at dusk. Shh. He warned as the path lightened ahead, they rode over a scattering of squat mushrooms and into a circular glade surrounded by a stately oak, ash, and thorn tree. A slender tower rooted in the middle of the glade had toppled sideways long ago. Marble slabs scattered the ground. Its conical roof had broken into shards that spilled right up the path's opening. A weather vane topped by a fanged cherub had been stuck upright into the earth. Sunlight glinted on the pale stone remains of the fallen tower. Grass swayed in a mellow breeze. A man lounged at his ease in a fine draped seat constructed out of pieces of marble into a mockery of a throne. He held the skull at arm's length, studying it with a rueful but good-natured frown. As they reined their horses to a halt, he looked up and his eyes widened. Rowan and Will Kenrith... He said with an exaggerated aspect of surprise. How are you come here? A spike of agonizing pain lanced deep behind Rowan's eyes. She pressed a hand over her face, thinking her eyes were about to bleed out. But the pain faded. When she opened her eyes, she blinked several times and stared. Beside her, Will's mouth had dropped open as he gaped like a lackwit. Finally, he spoke. Lord Oko? He said the name hesitantly. Oko! Rowan echoed as the memory of that day flooded over her. What became of you at Beckborough? said Will. That's right, we lost track of you. Rowan rubbed her eyes as the last tremor of headache cut through her brow. Yet it wasn't really that strange she and Will had forgotten about the encounter, was it? Everything at Beckborough had happened so fast and with such appalling repercussions. Are you questing for the High King too? Is that your companion we saw by the bridge? The hunter? So many questions. 
and I have so many answers. Whose skull is that? Rowan stared at the gaping eye holes with a miasma of dread gnawing at her heart. A question I have been asking myself all morning, as I contemplate the meaning of death and the vagaries of life. Who are we, really, in our hearts? What does it mean that this lost soul met their end, in a beautiful glade amid sweet-smelling flowers, and beneath the all-embracing sky? Do such fates not make you wonder about why the worlds are the way they are? Do you not wonder at how the mighty flourish through cruelty, at how their lies masquerade as honesty, at how those in power tell you they are hurting you for your own good, while they bind you with chains of their own making? That's why we strive to be virtuous, said Rowan stoutly. He sat up taut and eager. Yet what if the virtue is not enough? What if virtue is a lie? Virtue can't be a lie. Who tells you it cannot be a lie? The very ones who trust you into a cage and torture you. People do not like to have their own behavior held to account or even criticized. I know that from my own humbling experience. And I am fortunate to be alive and free at all, young Rowan. I cherish my good fortune every day as I breathe the strengthening air of freedom. It's my hope I can help others, the hapless, the ignorant, the weak, the youthful strivers like you, to embrace freedom alongside me. His words rang in her ears like the toll of every unanswered question she had ever asked. His somber gaze pierced to the deepest part of her, the one that chafed at the restrictions placed on her, all the demands and refusals, the low-voiced disagreements between her parents broken off whenever one of their children came into the room. Were you really tortured? She asked. Will reached out to touch her arm. Ro, you don't ask people that kind of question. Never apologize for asking honest questions. I honor those who seek answers. Oko set down the skull. Yet... I would not sully your innocent ears with the coarse and grievous tale of the early years and how I survived them. Let me say only that I was put in a cage by the very people I trusted most. All the while they persecuted and maltreated me, they claimed to do so out of love for me. They called me debased and dangerous when I would not bow to their whims and commands. Will shook his head as if to dislodge cobwebs. I'm sorry for your troubles, Lord Oko, and I don't mean to sound dismissive, but we are urgently on the track of a stag. A stag! He jumped to his feet. When did you see a stag? As the cobwebs of memory fully cleared from Rowan's mind, she flashed on that glimpse of a unicorn's horn seen through the trees. But she, Will, and Oko were the only people in sight in the glade. Where are the others? She said to Will. He turned to look back the way they'd come. They were supposed to be right behind us. That was the only trail I saw. Rowan's mouth went dry. After Titus's death, she ought never to have taken anything in the wilds for granted. Yet now, she and Will had carelessly lost the others. Have you seen our companions? She asked Oko. The wilds hold tight to its secrets, does it not? Why would you suppose I had seen your companions, or a stag, when I have been sitting here, enjoying the sun? Relaxing, Oko strolled over toward them. Somehow, he had in each hand an apple, which he fed to the grateful horses as he smiled, first at Will, and then at Rowan, with a look of bright inquisitiveness. When we met at Beckborough, I thought you two not yet old enough to partake of a quest into the wild. We turned eighteen on Winter Tide's Eve, said Rowan. Ah, time does fly, does it not? Tell me of your journey. How did you get here so quickly? I am given to understand it can take nights years to find this place, if they ever find it at all. Rowan was startled at how much she wanted to impress him with their deeds and valor. We first 
road to Vantress. To speak to the mirror? The mirror, he exclaimed, clapping his hands together, clasping them at his chest, as if delighted by her cleverness. Yes, Indralon has been refusing to speak to the knights and questing folk, but Will and I were admitted into the watery pit. Of course, two fine young people like you were given that honor. Then what happened? The vision we saw sent us to Garenbrig. What vision was that? Oko asked. Can you describe it? We saw... Will kicked Rowan's ankle and lowered his brows in warning. You haven't seen a stag or our companions, because if you haven't, then we need to keep searching, don't we, Rowan? Oko's gaze flashed to Will. A flicker of anger and the narrowing of his eyes, Rowan put an uneasy hand on her sword's hilt at the burst of unspoken hostility. But the darkness in Oko's eyes faded abruptly when he looked past him toward the clearing's edge. A silky smile pulled at his lips. Ah, here arrives a loyal companion, he murmured. With a lift of his eyebrows, Rowan turned to see Kato and Elowen entering the glade by a path she was certain hadn't been there when she and Will arrived. She was so glad to see them, and obviously they were relieved to find the twins as well. We feared we lost you, said Kato as they hastened over. Where is Cerise? We thought she was with you, said Will, in alarm, casting his gaze around the glade as if somehow he could spot the missing Cerise. How could he have left her behind? I told you children not to ride off in a rush, said Elowen. These ruins are a maze of shifting paths. We'd better leave here at once and search... The lore mage broke off when she realized her horse was not moving as Oko fed it a tempting apple. He then offered a dead rat to Hale, who delicately snapped up the rodent. What a magnificent creature you are, Oko said, scratching the griffin at the top of its beak as it purred. In Ardenvale, no one approached the griffin without asking its knight's permission. Kato stared at him from the saddle too astounded by the impertinence to protest. Elwyn felt no such impediment. Who are you? This is Oko of Loctwain, said Rowan, embarrassed by the lore mage's rudeness. Kato cast a look around the glade as if he expected an ambush. What is a denizen of Loctwain doing in the heart realm of the wilds? Have you already forgotten what I told you? Elwyn said. Queen Ayara sent an envoy some time ago to negotiate with the Council of the Druids. How perspicacious of you, said Oko. Am I not correct in identifying you, friend, as the Lore Mage of Vantress? Why, yes. So I am a Lore Mage, without question the most knowledgeable scholar in the realm when it comes to the wilds. Elowen tugged at the sleeves of her blue and silver gabardine as if stricken by an unfathomable attack of self-consciousness. Kato considered the handsome elf with a cold and suspicious gaze. Have we met before? Something about you looks familiar, but I can't quite put my finger on what it might be. Oko sighed, eyes widening innocently. Have I done something to offend you in the brief period of our acquaintance that you treat me with such distrust? I carry no weapon. In all aspects of life, I endeavor to be quite the gentlest and most cooperative person, my friend. I am not your friend, said Kado. Perhaps not yet, although I hope your feelings for me may change as we get to know each other better. Perhaps we can help each other in our quests. I am waiting here for the Council of Druids to hear my plea. The Council of Druids was disbanded long ago. Elwyn frowned at the sky, gaze gone contemplative as she mulled over his words. It's said to meet only at times of great crisis. 
Oko raised both of his hands in a gesture that encompassed everything within the glade. The fallen tower, the whispering grass, the trees and all sides rustling with leaves stirred by wind. Is not the disappearance of the High King a crisis? Is the realm not struggling with disorder and disagreement? Are the courts not fighting among themselves? Might this not be the very chance the Council of the Wild seek to regain what was torn from them? By attacking when the realm is weakened. Oh ho! My ears are all a prickle! Elowen leaned forward to use her seat to loom over Oko, but even though she was on horseback and he was on foot, he in no way seemed disadvantaged. Is that why Queen Ayara sent you? Is she making an alliance with her kinfolk to assault the realm in Alginus's absence? No! Protested Kado. I don't believe it. Not even... Not even Ayara. I saw Queen Ayara in the amphitheater, said Rowan, breaking in. There is a council meeting, and they are discussing attacking the realm. But Ayara is arguing against it. As she would do, with Linden still holding court at Ardenville, said Kado. Queen Linden, Oko scoffed. She received the title because of her marriage to the High King. She is not High Queen in her own right. She has not enough authority to lead the realm. Elowen gave a scornful snort. Pah! How little you know of Linden, young pup. I don't like her much, but she does more than anyone to hold the realm together. Addo's tone was stern. You might as easily say Alginus is the banner of the realm that waves beautifully in the breeze, while Linden is the haft to which the banner is affixed. Do not mistake me. Many hands carry the realm, not just this one. But Linden's strength and responsibility has held us together, and will keep the realm unified for a great deal longer. He broke off, then finished in a quieter voice, even if the worst happens. Will said, Where is Cerise? We need to find her and look for the stag. No need to go looking as all paths lead to this glade. Oko gestured toward the vine-draped seat where Rowan and Will had first seen him. In the interval, it had blossomed with an astounding array of purple and white flowers. Will you join me for a small but refreshing meal while we wait? I would not be only gratified, but jubilant to be honored with your company. Elowen laughed heartily, and rather caustically. You're an admirable sight. I admit, and very well spoken, with a charming manner, but even you cannot think us so ignorant as to eat a meal offered to us in the wilds, and especially not within a fairy ring. A fairy ring? he asked with gullible sweetness, tilting his head to one side. Come now, young fellow, don't think to play this game with me. I know what a fairy ring looks like, indicated the clearing. Only then did Rowan realize the glade itself was round with mushrooms crowded at the edge of the trees to create a white circle. A circle she and Will had crossed without noticing in their haste to seek the stag. And by the way, you're no lord of Loch Twain, Elowen added. You injure me with your doubt, his tone remained light and he clenched his hands, shoulders gone stiff. It took me a moment to notice. Nowhere on your person do you wear the sigil of Loch Twain's goblet. Oko glanced down at his clothing, then up again with the narrow-eyed gaze he'd cast at Will moments ago. Just another elf making trouble, Caddo muttered. Perhaps, said Elowen. Tell me, Oko, which is your mother's clan? And to which clan was your father born? Why do you ask? He said in a too quiet voice. 
Any elf is obliged to answer that question or be dishonored. There's something about you that doesn't add up. I don't think you're an elf. I think you're an imposter. Maybe even a witch. A witch! Kaido drew his sword. Oko reached out like a snake, striking to grasp Elowen's wrist with his left hand. I don't like people who accuse me, he said in a tone so chilling that Rowan nudged her mare forward to push between the lore mage and the elf. But it was too late. With a sparkling flare of light, both Oko and Elowen vanished. In their place appeared two crested eagles, one perched on the ground and the other in the saddle. Elowen's horse, Sheed, dislodged. The eagle in the saddle squawked loudly and flapped into the air, followed by the other eagle, the two rising so quickly Rowan couldn't tell them apart. One kept flying while the other landed at the edge of the clearing and in a twist of light turned back into Oko. Oko whistled, the sound so harsh and loud Rowan covered her ears and Will ducked reflexively. All three horses snorted and sidestepped to get a better line of sight on the noise. Shadow rained hail around, the griffin spreading his wings in to make ready to attack. The vegetation behind Elko thrashed with movement. The hunter appeared out of the forest, with the stag walking to his right, and Cerise limping beside Sophos on his left. Cerise's hands were bound in front of her by a vine whose nettling sting had turned the skin raw and red at her wrists. Her face was bruised and smeared with dirt. A leaf covered her mouth like a gag. Wait! shouted Will to Kado before the griffin could leap. We can't risk Cerise. Did you see what he did to Elwyn? Oko looked over the new arrivals with a sour stare, all his good humor and charming smiles flown away like a transformed lore mage. Dog, I'm disappointed in how long it took you to fetch the stag. I see you caught another morsel on the way, and a unicorn too. Murderous beasts I hear. God our guests, they mustn't leave the fairy ring. Yes, master. A stalk sprouted from the ground and at an astonishing speed twisted into a green halter binding the stag's head. If you'll excuse me, my friends, and I know you will, because I'm not giving you a choice. Oko bowed with a flourish as he took hold of the stag's vine-grown leash and walked into the trees. The vegetation thrashed and churned as if a hundred redcaps were beating the brush, but the rustling at the edge of the trees wasn't animals or creatures. It was a spurt of impossibly rapid growth, magical growth. Vines slithered between the trunks of trees, weaving a barrier bristling with thorns and nettles that wound up along the trunks. Come on! Rowan shouted, racing for the edge of the glade. The vines were taller than them already, writhing through the canopy, reaching ever higher. With her touch, Rowan pressed lightning into them, but green living things do not easily burn, and her magic fizzled. Will's ice touched them with no more effect than a fall of snow on a winter forest. Hale leaped skyward with Kado, but the vines had already grown past the canopy, weaving a latticework dome over the glade. They were trapped in a cage of thorns. From the other side, Oko raised a hand with a careless wave and strode away into the ruins, leading the stag. Rowan stabbed at the vines with her sword, but their skins were too tough for a blade to cut. She took a step back as a cold foreboding tightened its bony fingers around her courage and squeezed it dry. Will had gone white as snow, all heat drained from his face as the truth set in. He must have done to Father and Beckborough what he just did to Elwyn, Will said hoarsely meeting Rowan's gaze with shared understanding. The stag is father! She sank to her knees in the grass and pressed her hands against her head, rocking back and forth. Her head thudded so hard in her chest, she thought she might die rather than endure it a moment longer. But she did endure. She kept breathing. The sun began to sink toward the tops of the trees as shadows grew long over the clearing. He's taking the stag to the midwinter hunt! That's how he means to start a war between the realm and the wilds.